Give me liberty and give me a net. Welcome to Annette on Life, Liberty, and Happiness. I'm Annette Bybee. I am your host. And today being the day before Thanksgiving, um, Wednesday, uh, hopefully I post this tomorrow, I wanted to talk about a group that is not um, acknowledged often enough in our history, and that is the Pilgrims. And I want to do that by using this awesome new book by Tim Ballard, or Timothy Ballard, Timothy Ballard, The Pilgrim Hypothesis. And uh, just to give you an idea of what his hypothesis is, I will read you what's on the front cover. America is a country with deep-seated roots of faith planted by pilgrims seeking religious independence. It was these men and women who paved the way for a free nation under God in this promised land. But if, what if those early voyagers were brought here for a much greater purpose? What if their arrival in this new land heralded the fulfillment of ancient prophecy, laying the foundation of a country that would allow for the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the beginning of the gathering of scattered Israel? So obviously, as the book indicates, this is a hypothesis. Tim Ballard has several hypotheses that he's written in his various books, and I've actually covered some other hypotheses in earlier podcasts. But this one is definitely the most um, foundational to our country. And it basically makes the argument that the pilgrims needed to come here first before the restoration of the gospel could occur. And it seems obvious, but what a lot of people don't know is that the pilgrims came here from um, Holland. And first they were in England, but then they lived in Holland for a while and they were successful in Holland. So they weren't running away from um, religious tyranny at the time that they came to America. And um, they, you know, they were over there and they were in Holland and they were actually fairly successful. Uh, they had um, a group of 300. Well, this is what Ballard says. These English separatists should not be those thought of as exiles or second-class citizens in Holland. To the contrary, their congregation had grown to around 300, and their citizens were counted among the most respected citizens in town. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like the Revolutionary War. A lot of people don't realize that um, the uh, colonists actually had it pretty, pretty well. They are pretty good. They didn't need to... Uh, declare independence and they were actually taking a really big chance in doing that and um, less than half of the people were for that and so again here it's kind of odd you know they're living in Leiden Holland and um, they were doing pretty well they were respected they were protected um, there was really nothing um, that was pushing them to have to leave um, and so it, as Ballard points out if they didn't like Leiden there were other places in the Dutch region where they could have migrated to establish themselves. And yet because of Columbus's work, and he talks about Columbus quite a bit in the book, um, I'll just backtrack a little bit and say that he makes the case that um, Columbus was inspired, um, that he felt called to come to America or to come this direction and find um, a place where uh, a new Jerusalem could be established and um, he felt like he was called of God. And so that was the forerunner. And, and the book actually is even handed. It, it, it does talk about Columbus's faults and his mistakes. So um, he doesn't just focus on the good parts, but um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on Columbus because I wanna keep this short and I wanna focus on the pilgrims. Um, as, anyway, getting back to the quote, and yet because of Columbus's work, they knew of this other option, this distant land called America. And that was where they went to this wild, dangerous, untamed and unknown land where natives were known to kill European settlers. Why? Certainly whatever hardships they faced in Holland would pale in comparison to the hardships of starting over in America. It seemed unnecessary and it seemed an unnecessary and ridiculously risky move. And once the pilgrims got to America, they were attacked by natives, they were starved out, and then one by one, they began to die. Within months, they lost roughly half of their total number to disease and starvation. Um, 
and then the small band of remaining survivors, still sick, still still dying, and now widowed and orphaned, could have returned, but they stayed. And I'll get to that again later. So, um, the you know, the question is, why would they stay? So um, he answers, nothing makes satisfactory sense unless and until we consider the gathering of Israel. Unless we consider the need for God to bring a pure-hearted, religious and covenant-minded people to begin the miraculous process of establishing a covenant land to host the restoration of God's gospel and the temples on the earth. This was the key. The first settlers need to be needed to be believers in God and his covenant upon the promised land of America. If not, the covenant wouldn't take effect. The miracles born of the covenant, which miracles built the nation and brought us liberties found in the Constitution, wouldn't take effect. And the gathering of Israel and the restoration of the gospel, which requires the liberty born of miracles, would be severely jeopardized. That's how important the pilgrims are. And so then, the, you know, the question is, do, did they know how important they were? Did they know why they were supposed to be there? Um, before they left Leiden, they came together in a special service. And as one member said, the Lord was solemnly sought in the congregation by fasting and prayer to direct us. Um, Ballard says, by the time the service was over, this was what they looked at as a, call, a solemn assembly. It was decided. The Lord had spoken. They would go to America. Pastor John Robinson drafted a letter stating the reason for the voyage. The principal reason he gave was that we verily believe and trust the Lord is with us and that he will graciously prosper our endeavors. And we are knit together in a body in the most strict and sacred bond and covenant of the Lord. Bradford added that their move to America was so inspired by their desire to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to parts of the world that did not have it. So they knew that they wanted to come over to the new world and spread the gospel. Ballard said, knowing God was with them and knowing they were to take the gospel to all the world, they trusted in the protection of a covenant they made with each other and the Lord. Indeed, they were called. That was why they went and that was why they stayed. Going back to Ballard, Lehi said the same National Covenant Foundation, Lehi laid the same National Covenant Foundation. Once he found the land of promise before he or his people built temples, they too needed to build that protective foundation, that covenant on the land. We have obtained a land of promise, Lehi said, a land which the Lord God hath covenanted with me. And if it so be that they shall serve him according to the commandments we, which he hath given, it shall be a land of liberty unto them. Ballard continues, did the pilgrims follow the pattern? Just before they left, Pastor Robinson, who decided to stay in Holland to oversee those who could not make the voyage, led them in fasting and prayer. He then sent them off to America with profound instructions. We are daily to renew our repentance with our God, he stated, especially for our sins known, for sin being taken away by earnest repentance and the pardon thereof from the Lord, great shall be your security and peace. The national covenant was invoked. So um, Tim Ballard's pointing out here that the pastor Robinson is, is expressing the parts of the covenant. And we know the covenant of America is if we obey the commandments, we'll be prospered in the land. And so this is their version. If we are daily to renew our repentance with our God, especially for our sins, our sins being taken away by earnest repentance and the pardon there from the Lord, great shall be our security and peace. So in other words, if we are repenting and doing our best, we're going to be protected by the Lord. That was their covenant. But, and back to Ballard, but did the pilgrims themselves say or do anything to corroborate this? Did they feel this connection to the ancient covenant and to the restoration of Israel? Before boarding the ship bound for America, they would have heard Pastor Robinson explain to them. Now, as the people of God in old time were called out of Babylon civil, the place of their bodily bondage, and were to come to Jerusalem and there to build anew the Lord's temple, so are the people of God now to go out of Babylon spiritual to Jerusalem, America, and to build up themselves as lively stones into a spiritual house or temple for the Lord to dwell in. And then um, as his pilgrim historian Rebecca Frazier explained, the pilgrim church 
believed they had a covenant like the Jewish people of old. Their comparison was the working of God's will to save the chosen people in the Old Testament. They constantly looked to the Bible for guiding examples. Back to Ballard. Certain lands bound by covenant would be part of the equation. When Abraham's children w went to these promised lands and invoked the covenant, miracles occurred and the people achieved great success. This is the power of a national covenant. The pilgrims needed that same covenant to build this new nation under God because America was one of the designated promised lands that fell under the Abrahamic covenant. They needed it, and because of that, they wanted the Lord to know what kind of nation they intended to be. When they got to the shore of America, they went so far as to imply that they themselves were the new Israel. They and those who followed them into America even named their villages and towns after biblical locales, Bethel, Bethlehem, and New Canaan, to name a few. More than a thousand New England towns were eventually named this way. They also regularly, regularly gave their children ancient Hebrew names from the first five books of the Old Testament. After the Mayflower anchored near Plymouth Rock, and as the pilgrims were disembarking, William Bradford exclaimed, Come, let us declare the word of God in Zion. This mission to America, according to Bradford, was as important as that of Moses and the Israelites when they went out of Egypt. Indeed, these certainly seemed to be the people of Nephi's vision. Ballard continues, Speaking of the pilgrims and those who's, who followed them to the New World, historian Dr. Gabriel Sivan concluded, They themselves were the children of Israel. America was their promised land. The Atlantic Ocean, their Red Sea. The kings of England were the Egyptian pharaohs. The American Indians, their Canaanites. But the pact of the Plymouth Rock was God's holy covenant. They saw themselves as instruments of divine providence, a people chosen to build new commonwealth, their new commonwealth on the covenant entered into at Mount Sinai. Clearly the pilgrims sought the power of the ancient covenant, so they lived after the biblical model, so God might honor their requests and bless them. Also, that's the end of Ballard's quote um, from the book. The other thing that he didn't talk about too much in the book was that the another really awesome, groundbreaking, incredible thing that the pilgrims did was to write the Mayflower Compact. And um, this is a quote from an article, the Mayflower Compact. The Mayflower Compact. As an idea, America began in 1620, not 1776, by Lawrence W. Reed. This is from FEE.org. Okay, so he says... Um, for the 102 English people aboard the Mayflower, this very week four centuries ago was one they would never forget. After more than 65 days on a perilous, storm-tossed journey at sea, they sighted land, Cape Cod, on November 9, 1620. They dropped anchor on November 11. In between, they produced a document to establish what historian Rebecca Fraser describes as the first experiment in consensual government in Western history between individuals with one another and not with a monarch. That was a big deal. We recognize that 200 word statement today as the Mayflower Compact. Its quadricentennial should be noted and appreciated by freedom lovers everywhere. Fraser's observation is an important one. Previous statements and declarations in which freedom was a factor were agreements between an aggrieved people and the king or queen who ruled them. Magna Carta, for example, created a new relationship between English nobles and King John in 1215. The Mayflower, the Mayflower Compact, however, had nothing directly to do with the state. It was a private contract between the men among the pilgrims and the men among the other half of the passengers called strangers by the pilgrims because they were placed on the ship by the sponsors in Britain to provide necessary skills to help the new colony succeed. During the voyage, tensions between the pilgrims and the strangers grew. When storms blew the ship off course and it became obvious they would land well north of Virginia, the strangers nearly mutinied. They argued that the wrong destination voided their agreement to assist the colony. Compelled by circumstances, survival hung in the balance, to settle the issue one way or another, the, the passengers did the adult and civil thing, and I would add the inspired thing. They put in writing a promise to each other to form a government of consent. Its laws would bind them all without religious or political discrimination. True to the long-standing customs of the day, 
Women could not sign such a legal document, but no evidence exists to suggest that if they could, they would have rejected it. All right. Anyway, so the Mayflower Compact was, was huge because, as they mentioned in that article, that was the first time a contract was written between citizens. No king, no state, just citizens. And obviously that was a forerunner to the Constitution. All right, so some of the, I wanted to just talk about a few of the miracles that kind of um, bear testimony to the fact that the pilgrims were inspired and that they were in a covenant because when you have a covenant with God and your side is to obey him and keep his commandments, his side is to protect you. And that almost always, uh, probably always, includes miracles. And so some of the interesting miracles were, um, well, let's see. They, uh, when they, when they landed, um, they were all hungry and starving and had no way to feed themselves. And they knew that they were gonna have to clear land um, and that that would take a long time. And um, so, you know, they, they figured they were gonna starve pretty quickly. But when they landed, the land was already cleared. It had been cleared by Indian or natives, I should say, um, who had cleared the land to grow crops. And um, then a plague had come through. And so they decided that the land was cursed and left. And so um, they left with all this cleared land. Also, when they first arrived, they were 250 miles off of what they, off of course of where they wanted to land and they kept trying to go south to go to that place where they were originally planning to land, but they were running into sandbars. And so they couldn't go any farther. And they all talked amongst themselves and realized, you know, maybe we were supposed to land here for a reason. And so not only was the land cleared there in Plymouth, but also it was on, there was like a knoll that would have, was a perfect place to build a fort where they could see everything. So it offered protection. And um, a few days after getting there, uh, a few of them went off in a smaller boat to see what they could find near them. And they came to a place where they saw um, what looked like something was buried. And they went and dug, and it was a cache of corn. <laughs> so they were saved by all this corn that had been buried. And, and the book talks about how they later repaid the natives who had buried that corn, and then some. Um, also, some, another miracle that occurred there um, was that um, when they landed, it wasn't long before uh, a native walked into the village and they were all like, freaking out, like, oh, we're going to get attacked. But instead, he started speaking English to them. And then another um, native came in later, a friend of his, um, who also spoke English. And I'm trying to find his name. It's very memorable. That's why I can't remember it. But anyway, um, he came in and taught them, not only did he speak English, uh, okay, the first native was Samoset, and the second one was Squanto. Squanto is the one I should have remembered. Um, they taught the pilgrims how to hunt and fish and plant corn. And they had a peace treaty with Massasoit, who was the chief of that area. And so instead of being attacked, they landed in the one area where the natives were willing to make peace treaties, and a few of them spoke English, and there's a whole story behind that, but they spoke English and so they were able to communicate with the pilgrims and help them. And that's that was miraculous as well. But something that was even more miraculous and has a tie to um, later times was on the trip over, um, this young pilgrim, and I'm gonna find the story here. He was a 20 something pilgrim who um, fell off the boat on the way over. He was a single, John Howland was his name. He was single, he was, um, I'm gonna find, I wanna find the uh, story in here and read it to you because Tim Ballard tells it much better than I can remember it. All right, so, so John Howland was a pilgrim, one of the originals who came over on the Mayflower. For reasons I'll explain later, he is my favorite. I like him in part due to his age and circumstance as he boarded the Mayflower. He was single in his 20s and still figuring things out as he went to an unknown and dangerous land where there were few prospects for marriage, family, or social progression. 
things men his age tend to desire and seek, with no guarantee that he would ever return. What was he thinking, for that matter? What were any of them thinking? All right, I'm going to find the rest of the story on Howland. But basically, um, he falls overboard. There's a big storm that happens, and he falls overboard, and um, he thinks he's done for. He thinks he's history, and um, he's not. Instead, he is able to, there's a line from the, the boat, I can't remember what it's called, but that's not supposed to be ever leave the boat, and um, it falls into the water, and it lands either right in John Howland's hand or right next to his hand, and he's able to catch it, hold on to it, and pull himself back on the boat. And this, this is a man who should have been gone. Um, and he's not. He survives. And so that was a miracle, but that's only the beginning of that miracle. Um, because what John talks about, or what um, Tim talks about later, is that he found out that John Helland, and this guy, this always really bowls me over. He found out that John Howland's great, 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 I think fourth grandson was Joseph Smith's father. And um, because, let me just find it here. Joseph Smith's fourth great grandfather was a name, was a man by the name of John Jr. That was John Howland's son. Emma Smith's Fourth great-grandmother was a woman named Hope. John Jr. and Hope were brother and sister. Their parents, John Hallen and Elizabeth Tilly. So we have this man who should have been dead coming over on the Mayflower, miraculously survives, gets himself back on the boat, later comes to the new land uh, and gets married, and his descendants are Joseph and Emma Smith. And obviously they're related, but not very closely since we're talking about fourth, great, great, great. Well, anyway. Um, and the book also goes into some detail about how um, there's a man in England who believes that the tribe of Joseph through Ephraim made their way over to the British Isles um, when they were scattered. And we know we don't hear much about Ephraim after they're scattered in the Bible. But he offers the hypothesis that they made it over to England and so that the tribe of Ephraim was living in the British Isles. And so the, the thought is that these pilgrims could have actually been descendants of the tribe of Ephraim who came over on the Mayflower. And that, that's, that Joseph Smith, we know, is, we know that Joseph Smith is the descendant of Joseph. And so it could be that it comes actually directly through that line. Anyway, I, I encourage you to read that. Um, there's, it's too much detail to go into to explain why um, this man believes it. But they offer a lot of evidence that's um, really quite interesting. Also, what, that's one of the other neat things about this book is that it's got these QR codes all throughout where you can stop reading and um, scan the QR code and watch a little video. Um, where um, Tim Ballard goes into more detail and shows some of the places he's talking about. Um, he also goes into great detail about um, the Louisiana Purchase and Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. And a few interesting things that he gets to later about John Adams is that um, when he went to the Adams, when Tim Ballard went to Adams' home in Quincy, they pronounce it Quincy. I've been there, I know. And um, I wish I would have known what he talked about in this book when I went to visit, but he said when he went to the Adams house, um, they went into the library, which is a separate building, and um, somebody asked, you, asked the docent, what's your favorite book or what's the most unique book here? And she pointed right to this little book that ended up being the Book of Mormon. It was a first edition signed by Joseph Smith. And um, he apparently gave it to um, Charles Francis Adams, uh, who I think is John Quincy, Quincy Adams' grandson. Anyway, so that is there in the Adams home. Um, he also goes into some detail about Jefferson and Adams and their relationship, um, which I already knew about, but I want to add this as off topic a little bit, but because it was so awesome, I have to share it. 
and then I'll wrap this up. But um, I don't know if you all know that um, Jefferson and Adams both died on July 14th, 1826, 50 days, 50 years to the day of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And um, this was after they renewed a, re a friendship that had gone sour. But, um, and I've been to John Adams' home and I've seen the room that he died in and I've seen the chair that they say that he died in. But what was interesting was that John Adams died after Thomas Jefferson. But when he died, the last thing that he said was, Thomas Jefferson survives. And I've never understood that, why that would be. Why would he say that as he's dying? Um, why would he say that if Thomas Jefferson had already died? Well, what Tim Ballard says, and I can't remember who else had the idea, but that he thought that Thomas Jefferson had come in spirit to pick him up and take him, take him with him to the spirit world. And I think that makes perfect sense because those two had been such good friends and such close friends for many years and they were the voice and the pen of the Declaration of Independence two of our first presidents, they were so close and then they had a falling, a falling out because they disagreed on how to run the country. Um, but then there's, there's more story in here about it, how they got back together again and how they wrote letters to each other for a long time and became really close again at the end of their lives. And um, so I think it makes perfect sense that John Adams was seeing Thomas Jefferson coming to pick him up <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want to do this. But anyway, I had to share that because John Adams is one of my favorite presidents for a lot of reasons, and Jefferson too, of course, and John, George Washington. I mean, they're all awesome. But I never really had much of a chance to go back and really study the pilgrims and their devotion and their willingness to come over. Um, again, they were doing just fine in Holland they were not being persecuted anymore. They could have stayed there for the rest of their lives, or they could have gone to a different part of Holland and continued to practice their religion in peace. But obviously they felt called. They felt like it was their, the Lord was telling them to go to America where they could further spread the gospel. They felt like they were the new Jerusalem. They were to establish the gospel in the new world. And there is ties into what Columbus said about it as well. I highly encourage you to, to um, get this book, read it, study it. I read it a few times and still can't quite take it all in. But I have even more respect for these pilgrims who came over and they lost half of, they lost half of them in the first year and three-fourths of the mothers died because the mothers would go hungry to feed their children and um, would physically put themselves in harm's way to protect their children. So three-fourths of the mothers passed away and half of the pilgrims in total died that first year. But yet when the Mayflower was getting ready to set sail back to Europe after a year and the captain said, okay, I know it's been difficult. Why don't you all come back with me? None of them elected to go. They all decided to stay. And even though when they left, they all cried and watched the Mayflower leave. And so obviously they knew that they were doing something much more important than just maintaining their own comfort and living an easier life. So I'm so grateful for those pilgrims that, I knew this was gonna be a hard episode. I'm so grateful though for those pilgrims who sacrificed their comfort to go out into the unknown, who trusted in their Lord and did what they thought that he wanted them to do, which obviously he did, and went out into the unknown, into this wilderness, so that later the Puritans could come through and further build on this and then of course the founding fathers could continue to build on it and then later 
Joseph Smith and the early members of the church could establish the gospel. So I'm grateful on this Thanksgiving for those brave men and women that got things started here in this country and including that includes Christopher Columbus who often takes a lot of heat. Wasn't a perfect man, but he did follow God when he needed to and when it was important and um, was able to come here and discover the continent. So again, I can't do this book justice, so I recommend that you get it. <laughs> and um, I thank you for listening and I hope that you're having a lovely Thanksgiving and, and celebrating it in whatever way you can. And please take a few moments to remember the pilgrims and to um, honor their memory and all of their hard work and sacrifice. Thank you to, for listening to Annette on Life, Liberty, and Happiness, where freedom lovers gather. And you can find this podcast on AnnetteTalks.com, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, YouTube.com forward slash Annette Talks. Until next time. Mm -hmm.